Hi, I'm Shakti Durga. Welcome to the Goddess Speaks podcast. This is a collection of discourses from the ancient goddess Artha containing spiritual energy and activations and discussions of those discourses. I hope that the teachings are beneficial to you on your personal journey of enlightenment. Let's now go to the Divine Artha and her discourse from last week, which was a nice, luscious, gorgeous discourse. And I think this will be medicine for anyone who's feeling a little wobbly today too. Artha was so loving on the last occasion. So reviewing our class on the 11th of December, Arthur was so loving and her first words were, Namaste, everyone, please don't be alarmed. And I thought, how odd that she would say that right at the beginning of the class when we haven't even found out what we might be alarmed about yet. Um, (laughs) There didn't seem to be a context to please don't be alarmed. But I think she was giving a general teaching about the nature of spiritual growth, that things just bob up for us to not be alarmed about. And it reminds me of the way I used to phrase this years ago when we were all growing quite quickly back in the day. And I used to say, rule number one in spiritual training is don't panic. So it doesn't matter what's going on. Don't panic because it doesn't help. And I think she's saying the same thing, but much more elegantly. So she went on to say, your consciousness as it expands must travel through the realm of new ideas because otherwise you'll limit your expansion as certain of the ideas that are popular and prevalent with humanity fly in the face of truth. Many popular beliefs are mere constructs upon which those who don't know have made a foundation and then they've guarded their foundation, entrenched their foundation and made it part of the fabric of what humans all assume is true without ever questioning whether in fact it really is. This happens time and time again through all races, all nations and all people. Wow, discernment is um, certainly becoming a big topic, isn't it? And always is through all nations, all people and all time. At the beginning of time, when humanity began, the divine in its wisdom gave a multitude of languages to the diverse people of the earth, to allow some diversity in what would become the bedrock or foundation of a belief system and, I guess, culture for each diverse group. And Arthur was basically saying that as a lot of the old languages have been lost to the earth and a few dominant languages have taken over, that this has created a more homogenous group of thoughts now amongst the human population than there has been in other cycles of history. And she said the homogenization of thought is a byproduct of the homogenization of language, that when people speak in diverse ways, they think about things differently because the bedrock of their culture is placed upon various assumptions, partial truths, colorings and flavorings, and all of that has allowed that group to survive and thrive in its environment But the problem is that with the homogenization of language and international culture, some of the richness of variety has been lost. And she said this lack of richness is repeated in the way humanity husbands or fails to husband members of the animal kingdom because we're creating a sort of homogeneity in the species upon the earth and whether it's chickens or cows or let's all speak English, There's a way in which it makes everything easier for everyone because you can communicate, there's plenty of food, whatever. There is a loss of cultural foundation and the loss of diversity is an issue. And she said this does cause suffering and the First Nations people particularly feel that suffering and the colonising nations who supplanted the previous diversities, they're playing their part in the unfolding plan And she said it's not a new phenomenon because they were supplanted by others back in the day and others will be supplanting them as the karma comes back. And I think we can already see many of the European countries and England are now colonised by a melting pot of all kinds of energies, ideas, thoughts and so on. 
She talked about as time wings her way forward, there'll be people who are drawn to preserve old languages and old customs and those who adhere to a more modernistic view and they'll see the other ones as anachronistic, but in truth they're not and they deserve to be valued and honoured. I'm sure this is something we would already feel intrinsically, but sometimes it's good to just bring this into the light, these teachings. So she said there's no judgment depending upon which spiral you find yourself on, whether it's the modern era of homogeneity or the ancient times where there were many more tribes. But she said either way, you have in your culture the crucible for the growth of your consciousness. And she said at the moment the crucible or the pots in which consciousness is growing need some attention. And she said this is obvious because of the levels of depression that humanity faces and anxiety. And she said these are aberrations in consciousness which give rise to aberrations in other things, often beyond the understanding of anyone who's involved in the process. And I felt she was really talking about the natural divine flow being blocked by the issues that are going on in consciousness at the moment. And just to remember that whatever's going on is the exactly perfect thing for our consciousness. And then a lot of the rest of the discourse was about that, I think. She said, don't let the mass consciousness define you. She said, you have to keep one eye on the mass consciousness, but you don't have to let it define you. And she said, there's this growth of wisdom that happens when you allow in some of the individuality that is you into the current karmic situation where you were thrust by your soul. And then she went on to say, and I felt this was a really crux point of her discourse, she said, humans often fear that if I'm thrust into dark and difficult situations, it's because I'm intrinsically bad. And she said, this is the beginning point of the understanding of the law of karma, but it's not the mature view. True it is, there must be some karmic bondage for any of us to incarnate upon the earth in the first place. And true it is that some obviously are born into more pleasant circumstances than others, and some are born into quite hideous circumstances. But she said it's important to note that in whichever circumstance you find yourself, that the best and richest opportunities for your soul are to be found in that And so it's kind of like, well, there's no point wishing it had been different because, in fact, you wouldn't be you if that had been the case. And she said, this is the point of this discourse. It is in whichever landscape you were planted that you will find the richest landscape for what it is that your soul needs in this incarnation. And it's the opportunity of a lifetime to find yourself in this circumstance For us here that your spiritual practice can help you to grow and build something unique, something valuable, and something that will be of assistance not only to us but to others. So she was talking about, yeah, those difficult situations, but also for us here in this class. This is a karmic circumstance, this class too. So it's perfect for our growth. And she said all of those karmic situations and circumstances are opportunities to optimize growth. And then she went on to talk about the problems I've had in my life and the ups and downs when I was younger particularly. There's been many ups and downs. And she said, without all that, we wouldn't have had Shakti Durga, the Path of Ease and Grace or the Mystery School. And there's lots of lives that would have not had the help that they have had because of the pain and disruption in the life of Kim Fraser. And so when you look at it that way, you think, huh, So it was all exactly perfectly what I needed so that I could optimize my growth and find what my purpose was for the life. And then she talked about all the things we enjoy in Shanti Mission, ranging from teachings to community events, sacred places, bhakti, yana, kriya, all types of yoga that we do, and many divine forms that we've been introduced to. And she said, without the life circumstances, with all its advantages and disadvantages, that that could not have happened. And she said, looking back, it would be impossible to say all of it was suffering, that all of it was somehow wrong or that it was a punishment. And she said it was more like a Petri dish in which many things grew and the exact nutrients 
that's correct for the highest and best chance opportunity and potential for growth is planted with you in the consciousness with which you're born in the exact timing of that birth with the placement of the planets all around you and other souls having their own journeys born into the similar time space as you are so that you're interacting with each other. Then she went on to talk about the joy that is a baby and she said the only way you wouldn't know that a baby is a joy is if you're mentally ill. But she said, for everyone else, babies are a joy and that's the nature of its own delight. And she said, we were all that once and that baby is still the essence of who we be. Although the current reflecting pool of the mind has learned many things and imbibed many reflections from the time of that first breath that have hidden our natural joy and delight from beingness, it's been hidden. And here's another of the crucial parts of this discourse, for me anyway. She said, over time, the reflection pool's been filled with the reflections of many of the people around us, of the culture, the fabric of society we live in, and our own reflections upon those reflections. Then we reflect someone else's reflections of those reflections, of our reflections, of the reflection of that which is going on in society. God, I was getting lost in all the reflections, but she wasn't. (laughs) Anyway, reflection, 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 all interweaving until nothing can be seen. Nothing that's truth arising from your soul can be seen. And in the normal course of events, the mind becomes a set of curtains that obscures your soul and the very truth of who you be. Very elegantly expressed, I think. Go, Arthur. And she said that we at least can see that means that we've progressed greatly in the story of human evolution. And the most empowering thing that can be said to us is that in whichever form of negativity or suffering you visit from time to time, you seek less of your answers in the reflected, reflected, reflected pool of your mind and instead seek answers through the regularity of your spiritual practices because that connects you with what's beyond your mind. And that's where the discourse was coming from. Then she said, any of the gods, goddesses, angelic beings who work through humanity and the soul of a willing and prepared human, like all of us, have to be cognizant of the realities of the culture and society in which we, the listeners of the voice of God, find ourselves because even for us, when we know the reflecting pool of the mind is just a reflecting pool and it's really more like a set of curtains, we know that. But she said too much truth coming all at once for you will still cause you to reject it because it will be dissonant from what's been put into the reflections in your mind, in your reflection pool. And that's why we spend so much of our time I now releasing getting the reflections out, 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 doing aspect meditation, doing purification, blah, de, blah, de, blah. You can think to yourself, well, I've been doing that for years and still stuff's happening, but you aren't able to assess what would have been happening if you hadn't been doing that and where you would be finding yourself now if you hadn't been doing all that preparation and purification. And she said, every day, find yourself immersed in a sphere that lies beyond the mind And your capacity for truth will expand. You will start to see into the causes of people's mentation and their suffering and you'll be empowered to bring forth that which will assist them. And she said it's possible to embody the divine qualities such that you can lift and shift people whenever they come into your realm, whenever they think of you, when they come to visit you, even for an hour or two. That person will be lifted by your energy and your presence and your home will come to be imbued with these qualities and the potency of the divine will be palpable in these places, even your home, and powerful to those of a sensitive nature. And, you know, we had um, a random guy come to spray our house for insects because we've had a bit of a problem and this man didn't know us from a bar of salt. He's not on a spiritual path. But as he's wandering around the house, he's going, this place is amazing. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, it's so calm here. He said, I've had a terrible week. And he said, since I've gotten here, I feel different. I feel really peaceful. He said, what do you people do? 
And I said, oh, yeah, we do meditation and teach people about personal development. And he said, whoa. He said, just being here is is really quite different. And he was really confused. He didn't know why he felt as good as he did. But he was just, his soul was breathing in. And that's what happens. And it will happen at your house too. And that's where it said that just being in the presence of people who do a lot of spiritual practices is good for the whole community. It actually sends out waves of beneficial vibrations that emanate from the epicenter, which is where you live. And so as you start doing your spiritual practices, literally religiously every day, your place becomes a vortex of light and then it holds you as you hold it and it's all very rich. Then she was saying, don't despair about your culture because out of every challenging situation comes a response and that response transforms the entire culture and everyone will have a different experience. It's been happening since the beginning of mankind. So she said, just embody a Bayer, the fearlessness and the mudra. And it was a reminder, don't forget, see the Devi with the Abaya Mudra blessing you. And for those of you who find it easier to see Guru blessing you, do that. But either way, feel the blessings that are coming. She said, when you look at your life through the lens of fear, you won't perceive accurately anyway. And the opportunity in which you find yourself and your species find itself, you'll be lost in the fear and therefore you're part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. And so it's really important to be rounding up from the fear. Oh, fear touched into that. Do what clearing I need to so I'm not adding my energy to that and it makes me look at solutions. So this does not mean we're out of touch with what's going on. It means that we are holders of the light to try and bring in something else. She said embodying Abaya and knowing that the Abaya Mudra is a tool for our spiritual growth. She said, if you've got to look at a statue a thousand times to get in your mind's eye what the statue with the Abaya Mudra looks like, do it, she said. Make it so that you can visualize the Abaya Mudra or have a photograph of Guru or a photograph of Durga or Jesus with the hand raised in blessing because that's the Abaya Mudra or Buddha, doesn't matter, as long as it's got the juice flowing through, which it will have. And powerlessness, see the powerlessness that you feel sometimes on behalf of your own life, sometimes on behalf of where's humanity heading, where's the world heading. She says, see this as an opportunity for growth and that doorways will open that are not yet visible because there's too much fear. And so to open these doorways and these avenues to new ways of being requires someone has to not have fear and to be able to stand firm and go, it's going to be fine, the divine will take care of it. There will be a way through this. I don't know what it is yet, but there will be a way. And to have that conviction and that faith that there will be a way. And so I see that as my job. I see it as your job as well to do that as much as we can. And she did say it's difficult with the news all around you being so ghastly. And then she went on to have a bit of a dig at the news reporters because she said those whose job it is to report the news have themselves had their reflection pool seriously polluted. And it wasn't like it's their fault. It just is. This pollution is made more manifest by the legions of demons who are upon the earth and who proliferate at various times creating discord and disharmony, deception, false news, and who tell us what we want to hear, having already sown the seeds of confusion and delusion in the minds of the gullible. And she said the problem of the media is a severe problem because it has come to the conclusion that fear sells and the more fearful we can make the population, the greater will be our revenue. Whilst the masses can be untroubled by the things that we are learning, you can't say this to the greater public. It's up to the light workers to help in the current situation and not give you power to the fear. And she said, news is slanted in accordance with the mindset of those who created it. It's always subjective and worse right now because there's so many vested interests at play. So she said, don't be alarmed. Again, don't be alarmed. It's come up again. Don't be alarmed by what you read 
but do cultivate compassion for yourself and others and behave and think through the lens of compassion and through the lens of kindness as to how we can best serve people through kindness. And as we gather our forces through kindness and compassion, slowly but surely we defeat that which opposes it. So don't give your power to darkness. Don't give your power to fear. Breathe in the abaya, the mudra of fearlessness, of Madurga. And she said the fearlessness of any realized being who realizes that it's all a play of consciousness, that none of it is strictly speaking real, and that the human soul is eternal. So it's a hard job, all of that, while we're here, but any mystery school is about helping to support people to come to this self-realization of what Arthur's just said. And then another paragraph that I highlighted, so it must be good. Try and remember these things yourself, beloved ones, and don't add your vitriol to what's already a world problem, but call that back and dissolve it and send love to any place that you perceive it is needed. And in this way, we open the doors to the higher possibilities and you'll see how precisely your experiences in your life for good or bad have equipped you for the very development your soul needs for its eventual liberation. And such is the gift of karma. And she says that Narayaniyama gives a teaching about whatever's happening to you for good or ill is the kindest thing that could happen to you right now. And so bear that in mind as you explore the kingdom of fearlessness and the better world that it will create. So there you go. I thought that was very interesting. The kingdom of fearlessness and the better world it will create. We just have to keep remembering and remembering and remembering these definite truths. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Goddess Speaks. If so, please share it with your friends and your family so they can benefit too. If you'd like to connect with me, visit my website, shaktidurga.com.